Hello and welcome to Saltwire today for Tuesday, March 28th. I'm your host, Kate Walker. Police are calling on the public to not share the name of the teen who's been charged in the Charles P. Allen stabbing incidents. Halifax Regional Police say they've been made aware of social media posts where the youth may have been identified. They warn sharing the name of a minor is illegal under the Youth Criminal Justice Act and may be grounds for a charge of breaching the publication ban. Police also say sharing or publishing photos related to the incident has the potential to negatively impact the investigation and are urging the public to not do so. Research Nova Scotia is investing $1.1 million in water surveillance. The idea is to better understand, monitor, and prioritize risks in our water. Researchers say wastewater surveillance has been an important tool in monitoring SARS-CoV-2 in communities since the pandemic began. They're now working on going beyond wastewater and COVID to other water systems and other health threats in the province. This is actually going to support a number of interlocking projects. So SARS-CoV-2 or, or COVID, the, the virus um, causing COVID-19 will continue to be part of it. But looking at its possible applicability to detect things like MPOX or monkeypox, but also looking at the freshwater side, potential uh, around cyanobacteria that causes uh, illness for people, for instance, swimming in lakes. The funding will also go towards new genetic sequencing equipment that will eliminate the need to send samples out of province. A project has been underway to restore salmon habitat in Sherbrooke, Nova Scotia. Now, thanks to major funding, it can continue for another four years. Saltwire's Aaron Beswick took a tour with habitat biologist Nicholas McGinnis to see some of the work being done by the St. Mary's River Association to rejuvenate the fish passage. A decades-long project to restore salmon habitat on the St. Mary's River got a $1.56 million injection last week to keep it going for another four years. We're standing on what is what I would consider excellent spawning habitat for Atlantic salmon and brook trout. It's clean, cobbled, there's not much silt in it. And the salmon come up here in the fall and they dig what we call reds, so two-foot depressions in the substrate. They lay their eggs and they cover it up. But the salmon need to travel kilometers up the river to those spawning grounds. So the River Association has been doing work to repair the damage caused by humans along the way. There's uh, a double culvert, and that prevents the upstream migration of Atlantic salmon during the spawning season in, in the fall. So what we've been able to do to mitigate this to some extent, we can install structures which we call tailwater controls below the culvert. It's less of a jump for the fish to go up. We're looking at the first of 25 digger log structures that the St. Mary's River Association installed in 2021. So the water goes up over the log, picks up a little speed and energy, and it scours out the pool below it. And by scouring out the pool, you're creating habitat for Atlantic salmon and brook trout. They can stage in those pools on their migration upstream. And this particular site, it's kind of an abandoned farm field. There was no riparian zone here, and there was some uh, serious bank erosion. That material's going downstream. It's ending up in spawning habitat, which really reduces the productivity of it. And we installed structures that we refer to as root wads, and they provide critical overhead cover for juvenile uh, salmon and trout during the summer months. And in the fall uh, months, when the Atlantic salmon are coming upstream to spawn, these root wads provide nice cover for them. They can tuck in underneath it. Uh, they're protected from birds of prey. And to complement this project, we planted about a 15-meter buffer zone of native tree species. The work to restore three centuries of damage to the St. Mary's River will be measured in lifetimes. But already there are signs of recovery. Year-over-year -year counts of the spawning nests made by salmon are way up. This is Aaron Beswick reporting for the Saltwire Network. One HRM jerk sauce company has expanded their business to Jamaican ketchup. Maritime Foods launched three flavors, regular, spicy, and dill pickle. It took about 300 cases of it to stock store shelves, and they're expected to sell 200 more cases this year, with repeat orders already coming in. I started the business back in um, 2016. I've developed a passion for what I'm doing and realized that, okay, I could do more than actually what I'm doing right now. So we want to expand our product line to help improve food security here in Nova Scotia too. 
So for the first two years, um, it was just the two jerk sauce that we had, and I had a company that was doing co-packing for us, but they got out of the co-packing business. I still want to uh, continue my business. I have no one to make it, so I decided to open up my own facility and uh, back in 2018 and um, offer the service to um, a lot of the local entrepreneurs like myself because I know that you know um, they need a place to call home also where they can get yeah. their products made. So when I opened this um, in 2018, I um, you know I just from word to mouth people um, seek me out for co-packing and stuff like that. But we co-pack for about 14, 15 different companies. We make kimchi, hot sauce, barbecue sauce. So we, we make all kinds of stuff. It's time now for a glimpse of today's Thinking Out Loud with Sheldon McLeod. Today, Sheldon is speaking with Shane O'Leary with the union representing Halifax transit workers. I'm seeing the ads. I'm seeing Halifax is trying to get people's attention to try and get them to sign up to, to sign on. But you're saying they're not staying. What, what's going on there? I think we've had 22 operator resignations so far this year. So far this year, since January 1st. That says a lot. Um, if you're bringing people in and training them and spending the amount of money training them, there should be some incentive to stay. And if it takes you four years to get the top rate as a conventional operator or an excess bus operator uh, who are paid even less than conventional operators, then there's no real incentive. When they removed Protection of Property Act uh, because the Crown decided to reinterpret it after 20 some years, we've lost a protection out there for our members. Our members are getting assaulted and attacked the same as every uh, transit system in North America. The, the transit operators are a target out there and they just decided to take away protection for us. So uh, it, it, it's not only underpaid and overworked, but it's unsafe. And for Sheldon's full conversation, head to the opinion section of saltwire.com. Time now for the Atlantic Sports Wire, presented by Scott Squires. Jenny Chorus is a member of the Ultimate Disc community in HRM, and she credits a school friend for introducing her to the sport. Uh, I originally got involved from my best friend in high school. Uh, her dad played, and she got me out playing on our high school team. Uh, and that was about 10 years ago, and I've been playing competitively ever since. What's your favorite thing about Ultimate Frisbee? Uh, it has to be the community. Uh, we get a lot of people involved who've never heard of the sport, and they can't believe that this is the first time that they're hearing about it. The people who play are great. Uh, they're enthusiastic. They're passionate. Uh, and so tournaments like this is just an excuse to hang out with some of your best friends. <laughs> Anybody that's not seen this sport before or not familiar with it, what would you want them to know? Uh, I think I'd say to them, give it a chance. I think a lot of people kind of initially when they hear about Frisbee, they think it's something that you just do with your dog at the park. Uh, but it's an awesome way for adults to play a really high level competitive sport. So if it's something that you're interested in, I, I would say to give it a chance. You can check out my full chat with Jenny at saltwire.com or on Saltwire's YouTube channel. In Halifax, I'm Scott Squires for the Atlantic Sportswire. Thank you, Scott. On to weather now to see what's coming up in the forecast. We're going to check in now with our weather specialist, Alistair Alders. Thanks, Kate. Well, it was a relatively cloudy but calm day here in Halifax. The sun also in the mix at times, and I know people are looking for more sunshine and warmer temperatures. Well, I can at least put a bit of sunshine in the forecast, albeit temporarily. This evening, partly cloudy, and we'll see the temperature near zero and chilly tomorrow morning, starting the day near minus four, but mainly sunny. Now, as we go through the afternoon, a mix of sun and cloud, and we will have a chance of showers, but it will be warm with a high of seven degrees, and winds will be light throughout the day tomorrow. The next system I'm watching, although weak, it's a cold front that will move through on Thursday. That will bring some showers over to a bit of wet snow Thursday afternoon through the evening. Not looking like a significant event, traced to locally five centimeters, so really it's not going to be a big deal for us. However, there could be a few greasy spots on the roadways, especially as we go through Thursday evening, so that's something we'll need to keep in mind and then still keeping track of that mainly rain and wind system that will move in on Saturday. Kate. 
Thank you, Alistair. That's all for now. For more extended video and full online articles, stay tuned to saltwire.com. And you can find us on social media. I'm your host, Kate Walker. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.